Now, this is the Mark V tank of 1918, and although it looks very similar to the earlier ones, to the Mark IV, for instance, inside it's totally different. It's got a new engine which was designed by Harry Ricardo, the, uh, yeah, who was a young engineer in those days. It's a six-cylinder petrol engine, but it's actually designed to deliver 150 horsepower, so it's a good deal more powerful. But it drives into an epicyclic steering system invented by Walter Wilson. It means that the driver, sitting up here, can drive the tank without the need of the three other people you had in the earlier tanks. It made it a lot easier to drive. It meant that the tank across country could wiggle about quite easily, and that had a, a detrimental effect on Germans who were trying to wriggle out of its way. But otherwise, it's very much the same. This particular tank was in action. We know it was in action. We've seen the report. And it's got the unditching beam rails. You can see them up here. And it's got the unditching beam on top. And the idea of the beam was that if the tank got bogged down in the mud, as it often did, you chained the beam to the tracks, it was dragged around the front here, you got underneath the tank and gave the tank something to bite on so that it could climb out of a muddy hole. It seemed to work, but uh, I don't think it did the tank a lot of good, sort of swinging off the tracks. In every other respect, the tank's very similar. It was altered as far as cooling's concerned. They drew in the air from the outside, but that was actually a mistake. On the earlier tanks, like the Mark IV, it drew all its cooling air from inside the tank. So there was a constant flow of air going through the tank. It wasn't always clean, nice air, but it was, it was at least moving. On the Mark V, the engine heat and the fumes stayed inside the tank because the air was coming in from outside, through a duct, through the radiator, and out the other side. The trouble with that was it made the interior of the tank very unpleasant and a lot of people were quite ill to the point of being rendered unconscious and having to be lifted out of the tank. So they altered it after a while to get better ventilation. But just for a while it was quite unpleasant in there. Um, otherwise, this tank also, you'll notice that the cab on this tank is narrower than the cab on the Mark I. It was done because they wanted to use wider tracks. They actually decided to use tracks 26 inches wide instead of these, which are 20 inches wide or 20 and a half inches wide. And in order to, over, to deal with that extra bit of track, they had to narrow the cab. They did it on the Mark IV as well, just to make it more um, flexible. But this one's fitted with the narrower tracks, which it was when it went into action. And it was at the Battle of Amiens, 8th of August 1918, when this tank really earned a um, military cross for its uh, commander in action. So it's got quite a history, even though it's uh, quite a rarity. There aren't many of them left. Funnily enough, most of them are in Russia, because we sent a detachment of these tanks over to South Russia in 1919, and since we were supporting the Whites against the Reds, and since the Reds won, our lot had to scarper pretty quickly out of Russia, so we left the tanks behind. They served with the Russian army up until about 1928, which is absolutely remarkable. Life, in one sense, and there's a load of them now all over Russia, scattered about for people to see in different towns. Otherwise, they're pretty well all gone now. There's one Mark V, I think, in the Imperial War Museum, and that's about all there is.